Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Toogie's Take podcast. Endo is here alongside me, and sir, it's it's a late show, but it's but it's not because we normally record on Fridays. But we were supposed to record on Thursday, and you weren't the one to oversleep the podcast this time. I was. <laughs> it's, it's always Endo. Someone. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing all right. I'm wide awake. Uh, I'm actually feeling a little bit sleepy, so I might just clock out random from the podcast. Yeah, no, I'm joking. Um, I'm doing good. Uh, it's been a great week. Unfortunately, I did miss uh, a lot of stuff that happened on Monday and the weekend. Uh, maybe we'll mm. touch up on that a little bit, like a little quick take here and there. But, you know, it's fine. I'm doing all right. Yeah. How are you doing, by the way? How was uh, <sighs> this is the first show after AE Dub, isn't it? It is. So that is the reason why I overslept. So uh, obviously, for those watching the video portion of the show, I am not in my office. I am live from uh, the Tukey's Take Podcast Studios, also known as my parents' guest room, uh, <laughs> visiting the folks before I uh, before I leave the state for a good 10 days on a sweet vacation again uh looking like there won't be shows uh for uh you know we might miss out on like three or four shows a little bit later on in the month we'll let you know um we should have a show on uh on tuesday as as scheduled as as always but april has been very busy and yes this wednesday went down to boston for all elite wrestling dynamite and uh first and foremost who boston never change Never change that city. Oh my god, the um, the traffic was something else this time, though. Maybe the worst Boston traffic I've ever experienced, and um, you know, I'm sure it's like this in most major cities. For whatever reason, though, it's gotten worse. Where if you are not Max Verstappen on the starting grid in your Formula One car, and the second the light turns green, if you don't go, the entire motherfucking line behind you is gonna honk at you. <laughs> Jeez. People in Boston love their car horn more than Duncan. It's incredible, and that means a lot. Um, but no, the show the show was awesome. I got to meet good friend of the show, a rogue pineapple. Got to meet old Piney at the uh, the end of it because he was there too. So it was a it was a hell of a time. You know, you get to see forty three year old Jeff Hardy jump off a ladder like it's twenty years ago. Um, it was just a really goddamn good time. But then, as we were just discussing before the show started, I uh, I got back Thursday morning. You know, stayed in the hotel overnight, and uh, I am like, oh, it's like one, two o'clock. I can take a quick nap, wake up, get ready for the podcast with you and Sin. And I fell asleep for four hours. Like in my head, I just picture you like full on like plank on the bed, just yep. full plank, just right there. Just we're back in two thousand mm-hmm. what thirteen again, just planking all over the place. I'm not a I'm not a back sleeper at all, but I was yesterday for that nap. So I guess that shows how much I needed to sleep. <laughs> but that was a great time. Uh, again, unfortunately, because of uh, missing out on the show yesterday, Sin of course is not here, and it, it sucks because one of our bigger talking points has to do uh, with the San Jose Sharks. So apologies uh, for that in advance. But Sin should be back. I mean, he will be back eventually. He actually might not be back for a little bit because of this impending vacation but Mm -hmm. with that we do have stuff to talk about today we're going to get right down into the main talking points of the show uh, because i'm a little bit short on time today too busy time this april uh but with that of course before we get started as always want to mention that this show was brought to you by our friends at manscaped you can use code to get checkout at manscaped.com for 20 percent off your order and free worldwide shipping again that is code to at manscaped.com they have the best tools for the job the best tools for wherever you need tools to be used. Here it is. And they have circular deodorant. Spherical. Circular. I actually need it right now, so you're getting a little too hot for TV action. We cleaning up my pits. <laughs> oh, yeah. Got that extra fresh smell, that patented Manscaped uh, smell. I was going to say, like, muff, but that's that's completely the opposite. It smells so good. Like, the, all their products smell perfectly the exact same. The way you, the way you love it. I think you meant to say musk, not muff. Oh, but muff. at the same time. <laughs> I meant to. You, and that's the great thing about Manscaped. I know it's not just for the fellas. If you want to take care of your muff, use code Toogie. 
at checkout for 20% off your order and free worldwide shipping. Oh Manscaped, the best tools for the job. Take care of your balls. Can we make the name of this show Muff? Is your, that your muff will that get past you? the censor? <laughs> God hey, damn listen, it. Listen, I'm not the only one in the house who owns Manscaped products, okay? I'm just there saying. Go. I'm not the only there one. And there's me and my girlfriend and the cat. And I'm pretty sure it's not the cat. <laughs> oh, boy. Nope, not going to say it. Do it. Do, we're friends here. I've known you for long enough, okay? I've been a fan of you for a while. <laughs> I work with you now as a business <laughs> you said, partner. You said the cat. And the first thing that came to my mind was shave that pussy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hey, listen, whatever it takes to tell these people that Manscaped is the number one thing for male and female or whatever grooming you need to do. And cats. Who knew? And cats. Clean up that pussy. Use Manscaped. Promo code Tugi at checkout. 10% off. 20, 10 to 20. 10% off and free worldwide shipping. Your balls, your muff, and your pussy. Well, thank you. And back to the show. So Doug Wilson's no longer the GM of the San Jose Sharks. Oof. Um, now this is, uh, you know, unfortunately, this isn't the way that you would have wanted to see his tenure end. But after 19 years, Doug Wilson is no longer GM of the Sharks. He's been on medical leave from the club, I believe, since this past November. Uh, and, you know, that was something that we've talked about on this show. I think even the first time Sin was on this show was um, the idea of... Has he kind of overstayed his welcome with the Sharks? Because from an outside perspective, you can sit there and be like, okay, well, you know, what what exactly have they accomplished super recently? You know, some of the contracts that have been signed. Is it the right thing to keep him? But so many Sharks fans, not just Sin, but the likes of No Sleeves, who I think is still like 300 hours into his fucking subathon stream on Twitch. Um so many people would stand up and defend Doug Wilson and say, no, we don't want him to go. And I can see why. You know, the Sharks made the playoffs in 15 of his 19 seasons leading the team. They never missed the playoffs more than two years in a row. They technically won more games than any other franchise between the year 2000 and 2021. He was essentially the... The, I don't want to say, like, for lack of a better term, like the pillar of consistency with you know managing this Sharks team. The only problem is, obviously, they could just never get over the hump. They could, I mean, they made it to the Cup final once. You know, I know that a lot of people look back to uh, the 2019 season where they lost to the Blues, who of course went on to win the Stanley Cup. Sons of bitches. Um, I'm glad to know. I, I was reading up on this. I'm glad to know that Sharks fans feel the same way the Bruins fans do in terms of like, yeah, no, the Blues kind of uh, got the refs to put away the whistle in that postseason. And boy, did they. Good yeah. work. Uh, but no, Doug Wilson was you know, and still is. I mean, barring these health issues that's forcing him to step back, he's still a phenomenal general manager. Again, it's just you look at his tenure and it's just unfortunately they go down as maybe the biggest example of a team that just couldn't get it done. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't know much about the San Jose organization itself, yeah. but you, you you do see the numbers here and everything there, and you know it's it's especially the way it ended. It's not what you want to see. Uh, usually, it's like a bittersweet farewell sometimes, or it's like or you get fired because of whatever. No, the fact that this step down because of medical reasons, it's it's unfortunate. Yes. So again, this is why it would have been great to have Sin on to kind of give his perspective as a Sharks fan. You know, I know I can speak for Endo and myself when we say best wishes to Doug Wilson. You know, hopefully again, this is uh, I want to say more of a precautionary thing as opposed to something that is you know um, more of a dire situation. Uh, in the meantime, Joe Will is now the uh, I believe the interim general manager of the Sharks team. He has been with the organization since day one. Uh, he was their director of scouting from 1990 to 1997, Jesus. their assistant GM from 97 to 04, their director of hockey ops from 04 to 2011, and then back as an assistant GM from 2011 until uh, April 6th. Of course, in the next day, he was named AGM. So this is 
like the guy within the Sharks organization. He's seen it all. Um, whether or not he's named the the long term uh, GM of the team, who's to say? But it does put the Sharks in a really interesting situation because they have uh, all of those long term contracts. They just resigned Tomas Hurdle. But I think it'll be interesting to kind of see, will it be kind of more of the same from what we saw from Doug Wilson as the GM, or will it be, you know, kind of a, a combination of what Joe Will would prefer versus what we saw the path set out by Doug Wilson? I, I thought the Sharks were an interesting team to watch anyway, even more so now. Definitely. Yeah. I know. It's one of those things. I'm trying to... It's like, hey, Endo, set you up to talk about a team we don't know about. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> and I feel and I feel bad, too, for not knowing much about the Sharks itself. But I just, they're all the way over there. I'm all the way over here. Like, we barely even see each other. Like, we have, like, one game a year, if not two. And even then, like, it's reading true. up on their stuff, like, it's not in my market. Then again, the Toronto market is just shoving the Leafs down your throat. Uh, we'll talk about the Leafs in a bit, but, like, I, I I will learn more about the Sharks, especially now well, after this. But yeah, let's be honest. As, as Bruins, as a Bruins and Leafs fan here, we often viewed the Western road trips, especially out to California, as just uh, well, pack it up. Mostly losing Big <laughs> for dogs. basically all of Doug Wilson's tenure. <laughs> so we try yeah. not to think about the people that hurt us. You know, mm-hmm. we try not to think about it. Uh, in terms of other things going on, again, we have quite a few things to talk about here, so we'll, we'll kind of go through them. But again, best wishes to Doug Wilson. Uh, the NCAA Frozen Four, their version of the Final Four, currently going on in Boston, as a matter of fact, at TD Garden. Uh, the semifinals saw the University of Denver beat Michigan. Uh, Oilers prospect Carter Savoy, who was the older brother of uh, top prospect Matthew Savoy, he scored the overtime winner. And then Minnesota State beat Minnesota, much to the chagrin of friends of the show, Mr. Pete Blackburn and Common Sense Sam, uh, who were there to see it. Biggest takeaway from this is, uh, so far, Michigan blew it. Uh, they, They haven't won since 1998. Already confirmed, Kent Johnson, who was the number five overall pick last year, he has left, uh, or at the very least has signed with the Blue Jackets and will likely get a chance, of course, to go pro. Uh, Their captain, Nick Blankenberg, who was undrafted, uh, he signed with the Blue Jackets as well. He's definitely gone. And probably the biggest one, Owen Power, number one overall pick to the Buffalo Sabres this past summer. He has signed uh, with the Sabres and then you have all these other guys, and once you start naming off these guys, it's like, how did this team not win? But other dudes that could potentially leave, now this one's unlikely, but Luke Hughes, you never know. The word's out, he's probably going to stay, but you don't know. Uh, John Beecher, first-round pick of the Bruins. Matty Beneers was the second overall pick to the Kraken this past summer. Thomas Bordlow for the Sharks. Brendan Brisson for Vegas with another first-round pick. Uh, Mackie Smoskovich was just a first-round pick for the Panthers, and there are other dudes in the mix this is one of the most stacked teams I think we've ever seen in the NCAA, and they uh, they they blew it. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to go and say like, oh well, you know they didn't work hard enough and everything. Give me to the Frozen Four. Uh, hockey is mm-hmm. one of the weirdest sports where any team on any given night can win completely. We've seen it with like top teams in the NHL going against. Um, Lottery teams and the lottery team just yeah. smacked the living crap out of them. <laughs> Habs versus Leafs, um, <laughs> Leafs versus Sabres, uh, but just in- entirely like you've seen that we've seen it happen. And I guess Denver just wanted it more. And Michigan, you know, you have a stacked roster with all these talent right here, all like first round, second round, third round picks, and can't get it done. That's just the way it goes. Um, I'd be interested to see how it's going to go. One thing to note that Owen Powers' contract uh, will slide past this year because he's playing less than 10 games, from what I've heard, Uh, because there's nine games left in their season for Buffalo, so it is going to slide through. So they have a three-year on top of this rest of the season. I mean, at this point, I'd have to think Denver, after that victory, would would get it done. And actually, you know what? I um, I had to look this up. I thought this is what I heard. So to just totally crap on what you just said, which is what you would think would happen with power, this comes from Cap Friendly. 
Because he's a late birthday, born in 2002, and signed his deal in 2022, Owen Powers' entry-level signing is age 20. This means that he is not slide eligible and will burn the first year off of his ELC, regardless of if he plays this season or not. <laughs> wow. Never mind. It's the, most, it's the most Buffalo thing to happen. That is so Buffalo. And then was it Denton Levi announced that he's going to return to Northeastern earlier this, this week as well, saying he's going to, oh, I'm going to play another year over there. I mean, like, yeah. Now, Colorado did do the same thing with Kale McCarr. Right. So you could argue it's a negotiating tactic to say, okay, Kale might be this good at the pro level. We'll have to pay him four or five at the end of two years. Right. I mean, Kale McCarr got fucking eight or nine. Basically, it's like, okay, it's probably cheaper to burn that ELC year and then not have to pay him as much after two years than we would after three. There's a couple of ways to look at it, but all in all, uh, rough times. Rough times for Michigan, but um, exciting times for Columbus and Buffalo. I mean, Columbus now uh, likely, I mean, obviously, like you have Kent Johnson, you have Cole Stillinger. Like that's, they're looking great in the aftermath of the Seth Jones trade. And yeah, then for Buffalo, like, I mean, we talked about it, like, oh man, it's it's looking rough. But in the aftermath of the Eichel trade and how well guys like Alex Tuck are fitting in there, then you get to sign Owen Power. They're going to have another lottery pick this year. If Buffalo plays their cards right, they're set up very well moving forward. Still feel like that's a big if, because I feel like we were here about 10 years ago, and it didn't work out too well. Speaking of not working too out too well, to, to just stumble my way to this transition, <laughs> let's talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh, boy. I didn't mention we were going to talk about them. Yeah. And a couple of different things happened. First and foremost... There was we'll, we'll talk about the bad first. Yeah, rip it off. Rip they it had a five one lead on the Florida Panthers this week, yeah. and lost seven to six in overtime. I was gonna say keyword did. They had a five one <laughs> lead. Oh man! My God! So this was their seventh loss after holding at least a four one lead since the twenty thirteen loss to Boston. This is the seventh time in nine years that they have blown a four one lead. No other team has done it more than three times. Okay, so one of my favorite memes about them just blowing leads is the uh, there's a picture of John Tavares, the one where he's like standing super still and super focused while everyone's fr- flinching on the on the bench, and like he doesn't see the puck. Like you know that one, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So someone grabbed every single lead that they've blown since that period of time and put it on like to put the the the, the score bugs on screen. And being like, it was like, like how many leads he's blown through. It's like he's going to blow a gasket. It's one of the funniest things ever because he looks super focused, but super like fucking pissed. Like it looks like JT's going to like scream, like yell because of how many times they've lost so many leads and all that. Like, like I don't know what else you can say about this team. They just, they just, they they have the talent. They just don't finish. All Swedish. And that's, no that's what's going to be frustrating, right? Because then we talk about the positive. Mitch Marner scored his 30th goal of the season in that game. Yeah. Since then, Austin Matthews is now up to 56 goals on the season. It's the most goals by an American in a single season in NHL history. And the Leafs still have, I believe, 11 games left. Austin Matthews currently has the second highest goals per game pace in a season since Mario Lemieux in 1995-96. He has a .83. Lemieux had a .99, which is insanity. Mm Mm-hmm. And then there was this stat, I believe, from the game before he hit 56, but there was a stretch, 82 games played for Matthews, 71 goals, 116 points. And now the Leafs are five points ahead of the Bruins. The Bruins do have a game at hand, and the Bruins are tied with Tampa, 70 points, or 70 games played, 93 points. So for the Leafs, you have so much going right. Austin Matthews is proving that he is a generational talent. The Leafs are, again, Five points ahead of both Tampa and Boston. Who saw that coming with some of their struggles earlier and the goaltending issues? But at the same time, you still have games like you, like, like we've seen and like we just saw. I mean, I know it's the Florida Panthers, but they had a 5-1 to one lead, and it still wasn't enough. 
this is why all season long you've been saying let's just wait until the playoffs yeah. because this was this this Panthers game is like the perfect way to sum up the Leafs. So promising, yet always in the back of your mind you're like, oh god, this this might go poorly. So I uh, I don't envy you in that in that way of just not being able to have any confidence whatsoever in this team, even though you should be allowed to have confidence. Okay, so remember how I said at the beginning, uh, all Swedish, no finish. Mm-hmm. The only player on that active roster that would have been Finnish would have been Harry Sateri. He was the I mean, key. Just having a Finn on there meant we had some sort of Finnish. But no, all we got is Swedish. I wasn't looking it up. They have, for team staff on that roster... Every single one of them, except for Dave, except for Daniel Kaplan, is Canadian. Every single one. He's a, a Kaplan's American, but like Keith Cabaret, uh, I, mean, I can't even pronounce that. Malhotra, I forgot Malhotra was a on the was assistant coach for the team. I forgot oh, him. Manny Malhotra. Yeah, like crazy. They're all Canadian. Anyway, that's the tangent that I'm just going off of. But yeah, Toronto. Congrats to Austin Matthews. I think he gets sixty before the end of the season, at least. Easily, it would it yeah. would take an injury or trying to rest him essentially. <laughs> so, Knock on wood. There you go. The Chicago hockey team announced that they are retiring a new number. No, it's not Duncan Keith yet, or Jonathan Taves, or Patrick Kane. Those those will happen. Marion Hosa. Oh yeah. And the number eighty one going to be retired by Chicago. Again, right now, uh, the number one retired for Glenn Hall. Uh, the number three retired for Keith Magnuson and Pierre Pellot, I do believe. Bobby Hall's number nine. Denny Savard's 18. Stan Makita's 21. Tony Esposito's 35. And again, they're going to be a lot more within the next decade, mm-hmm. um, you know, as members of that core from the three cup runs. Uh, granted, uh, Hosa was on the wrong side of it. Well, no, Hosa, Hosa was there. I'm thinking of, uh, thinking of the Pittsburgh-Detroit uh, situation and the, the flip-flopping. But... It's tough to say it's not deserved. It might be it's the most surprising of the bunch, but someone like Marion Hosa was very instrumental, crucial even to the success of those teams, even if his career ended in a in a weird way that almost seemed like a, a joke, just because it's like, oh yeah, he's allergic to uh, his equipment now. He has a skin disorder, and everyone's like, come on, that's a cap circumvention. But no, it's 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 legit. Yeah, his career. <laughs> yeah. But he's now in the conversation, too, of, I mean, you know, Hockey Hall of Fame is not out of the realm of possibility either. Getting his number retired by, actually, he was Hockey Hall of Fame, of course, 2020. I was going to say for all of these guys, right? Um, you know, obviously, like your your Keiths, your Seabrooks, or your Keith, your Taves, your uh, Canes, Seabrooks on the fringe. But so many members of those three cup teams for Chicago. Um in the conversation for having the numbers retired, if not going into the Hockey Hall of Fame, or both. I mean, you can't you can't argue with it, really. Yeah, that's just the way it is. Ooh. So, Speaking indeed. of other retires and numbers, uh, Ryan Getzlaff uh, announces yes. his retirement for, with the uh, Anaheim Ducks. So, Getzlaff... Spends his entire career with the Ducks despite having numerous chances to step away. Currently, and of course the season's not done, 1,150 games played, 1,013 points. Right. I should probably preface that. He did. He was going to retire at the end of the season, not e- immediately. Yes. Still, that's... Stanley that's Cup weird. winner. Yeah. Stanley Cup winner back in uh, back in 2007, of course, with the Ducks. Going to have his number retired by the team and is a part of that. I mean, is a part of that 2003 class where we could see numerous Hockey Hall of Famers. Yeah. Numerous. I mean, the 2003 class is is legendary and will continue to be because you look at that first round. Marc-Andre Fleury, Hall of Fame bound. Mm-hmm. Eric Stahl might have an argument. He yeah. might. Yeah, I would say he has an argument for it for sure. He's he's still kicking too, and he's doing 
Very Unofficial, well. not retired, but um, not playing. Just under 1,300 games played, over 1,000 points. Yeah. Has a Stanley Cup, of course. There's an argument. Um, you know, then you have guys who I'd say are that, that step below, but like Nathan Horton, Thomas Vanek, Milan Mahalik, all very good careers. Yeah. Ryan Suter. Uh, there will be an argument for Ryan Suter making the Hockey Hall of Fame for some people. You could argue whether or not it would happen, uh, whether or not Minnesota would retire his number. Who knows? Uh, we'll find out in the future. Uh, Braden Coburn had a great career. Dion Phaneuf had a pretty good career. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Carter. Jeff Carter, there is an argument for a Jersey retirement with the LA Kings. I think that's bound to happen. There's a Hockey Hall of Fame argument for Jeff Carter. I mean, he has two Stanley Cups, yep. 800 points in his career. Uh, you know, it just, and you could sit there and say, like, oh, well, 1,000 point minimum, stuff like that. But it's like the argument for like how the voting is kind of viewed for these guys. There's at least the argument. Same thing for Dustin Brown. Uh, I mentioned Brent Seabrook. He was a part of that other three class. I mean, Parise, Gatzloff, Brent Burns, uh, Ryan Kessler, Mike Richards both had great careers. Corey Perry, there's an argument for him as well. I mean, hell, you could see Ryan Getzloff and Corey Perry get their numbers retired in, at the same time, going to the Hockey Hall of Fame at the same time, if this is Corey Perry's last year. That 03 class is legendary, and those names I was mentioning were, were just the first round. Of course, you, uh, <laughs> you have the likes of... Uh, uh, oh, I don't know, Patrice Bergeron, Joe Pavelski, Shea Weber, who were later on in that draft. But an insane class. Uh, it's it's honestly going to be weird. And I'm sure it's even worse for Ducks fans to be like, oh, man, Ryan Getzloff's not going to be an active player. But I give him credit. You know, he stayed there the entire time. He was the 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 lovely bald head of that franchise for almost 20 years. And... Uh, Again, has a real shout at the Hall of Fame spot, and at the very least, uh, we'll have his number, you know, in the rafters at Honda Center. Yeah, Endo agrees. I know. I, I keep trying to be like such up. Like, any last thoughts? But it's like, nah, we summed it up just, pretty well. It's, sometimes, like, it just writes themselves. Like, sometimes I feel like, like the stats and your accomplishments that players have done, and that draft class entirely. Like, you don't even have to say like anything detailed about. It. Just say best draft class, probably O three. Now, this last little talking point before we get into random stat fun time. Endo, I'm just going to let you go because I know you were paying attention to the story and I was so busy Ooh. over the past couple of days I really didn't get to. Your thoughts on what happened with the Niagara Ice Dogs, if you can explain what happened, and just what what the hell. Like, you know, for you being in Ontario and kind of like the, the impact of this story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, if no one hasn't heard, uh, as of recently, as, uh, Tugi takes off and, uh, steps out of the room for a second, it's just me. Hi. Let's, let's talk about this. So, um, what happened recently, as in, like, three days ago, in the Ontario Hockey League, is, um, the Niagara Ice Dogs have suspended, uh, Coach Billy Burke and GM Bo Joey Burke, I believe they were both related, after investigation into a WhatsApp conversation which violated league policy on harassment, abuse, and diversity. They, along with the team, have also been fined uh, $150,000, and they won't be able to apply to be reinstated until June 1st, 2024, which honestly is the bare minimum of something you do in that situation entirely. Um, don't worry, too, you didn't miss much. I just went on, like, the, <laughs> the top of what we are talking about right here, how they got suspended. Um... And have not reinstated until June 1st, 2024. Um, you know, images from a WhatsApp conversation that was leaked showed Billy Burke complaining about the lack of hindsight coverage, calling Kyle P a pussy, asking who the quote unquote uh, C word. Uh, uh, it's a good way to put it. Good friend, good friend of the show, Reaver, uh, his favorite word, uh, is that <laughs> runs a social media account. And then Joey Burke responds, some C word named Nikki. She's a bigger F slur than our horseshit scouting staff. And the response to that is that we were venting. Um, yeah, so there are, there are other words you can use to vent. Um, you know, you can say like, oh, you can say it. If you're going to say something stupid like that, don't go off and call them a homophobic slur. You could say other words like, you know, this chick, whatever. You can call someone a bitch and not be rude about it. Realistically, like so, certain contacts. <laughs> but like, it's it's like, it's like of all things, of all the words to say, you say the ones that have like the most historical implications. 
Like, do you, you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. And, like, why would you... I mean, I know why they would do that, because they're pieces of shit, um, considering the rest of the stuff's happened in their history and determining with uh, not paying out certain uh, scholarships that were due to players, uh, mismanagement with players as well. Uh, I've received uh, some messages from people who are associated in the OHL um, who've asked to not be named, and they've mentioned several times in... Um, different meetings or different uh, areas that they've also said certain languages and words just out in front in the media room, like just, just full on, just right out there and like no coverage or anything whatsoever and no like apology or any of that stuff. So it's definitely something that's like ingrained in that, like in those two people right there. And I think they should just, there, there needs to be more than just them getting fined. They need to actually go and get something assessed or have someone work with them um, and talk about this shit because you are a person of power and of leadership. And this is how you conduct yourself. Uh, God knows how many stories we've heard and about uh, skepticism from the OHL and rumors and other things of younger players doing certain things. Like this is how some of that keeps going and keeps starting and keeps being fueled in the hockey. And you are a you are a organization that is growing the, the sport for youth and getting them up to the level, the echelon of being NHL or any other professional league in the world. And you are supposed to set an example for these children. I'm going to call them children because they get there on a 15, 16. They're, they're not, they're nowhere near adults, teenagers, if you will. And if this is the response that you're getting and you're saying it was that you're venting, God knows what you're saying regularly on a daily basis to these mm-hmm. youth and to these people and that has an impact on them like you may not think about it but that happens and it pops up in your brain a little bit it's it stays in there it sticks with you and i think what they've done the ohl's done is, is the bare minimum there should be some stuff on them having to go through training and sensitivity training and stuff like that to go through i believe that is also a factor in there i don't see it in this area over here but i think i saw an article that said they have to go through certain training as well to get approved to go back in for over there my opinion is that they should not sell the team they should be forced to give the team to someone else or if you're going to sell the team that money that goes towards that goes towards certain charities or certain benefits that can help people out who've been abuse in these situations before in hockey because there are charities that do help that and are there to help people out who've been abused and stuff like this like it, like this is unexcusable like my biggest takeaway from this is again kind of like you mentioned like they talk like this all the time yeah let's be honest and the fact that their response like you said they they responded is like oh well we were just venting we did use profane language but it was not racial nor is it abusive or directed at any of our staff members or male or female play like players like oh so because it's not directed at people that work for your team it's okay like just just dig yourself a deeper hole and that's you know that's that's the good thing right uh, a story like this hopefully helps shine more of a spotlight elsewhere because you know this is happening elsewhere yeah. you know this is what goes on you had Rachel Dory, now of the Vancouver Canucks, responding to their response on Twitter, saying that uh, she met both uh, Joey and uh, Billy Burke in 2019, and when she said that she wouldn't work for free, uh, yeah, they insulted her too, <laughs> to, to leave it at that. So, I mean, the details are out there. Um, like I said, it's one of those stories where it's just it's it's disheartening to read, but at the same time, it's it's obviously a tremendous thing that it gets out there. And unfortunately, this is probably far, far more common than a lot of us would like to think. Oh, damn. They Especially. Use D, they use the D slur. Like the, the, that, wow. Yeah. That is, like, that's, that is creative. That, that in the worst many, way, that is creative. Like, that's disgusting. How many people that own a team like this? Like, no disrespect to the Niagara Ice Dogs. You are a minor league hockey team. And people in charge of this team have egos like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on now. Like, you know, it's it's likely more of a widespread issue than we'd like to think. Yeah. Um, so, again, it's just good that a spotlight was shown uh, yeah. upon this. And, um, 
And again, these guys are away from the team for a good two years and hopefully longer as we continue to uh, kind of see some of the more negative side of things. I mean, again, just how how stupid do you have to be in terms of running a team to on a, on a group chat like that? Vent, yeah. as they say, We've, um, towards... Yeah. Again, like a league, essentially a league employee, whoever this Kyle guy is that they're referring to, they complained about the lack of highlight coverage that they were getting. So message him to say, why aren't we getting highlight? You're essentially talking about someone who works for the league. But, oh, it wasn't about someone. And, and again, insulting the other woman there who runs the social media account. Mm-hmm. But, oh, it's fine because they're not affiliated with Niagara. Like It's just astonishing. Astonishing. Yeah, how, another uh, thing too that we aren't we don't have on the people. docket itself, but I do think we do have to talk about this as well, is uh Ben Holmstrom uh getting mm. suspended eight games for anti gay language. Um like there's nothing to say about this stuff, and I, I hate we have to talk about this, realistically. But this is stuff that's happening in hockey and we're trying to phase this out and educate people on this shit and how why it's not okay. It's a slur. None of this stuff needed to be said at all. You there are other words you could say but you choose, but you chose this one. You you wrote your own path on this. Um, so far he's yeah, served so, two. Yeah, so far he's ter- he served two games of the eight. Originally, I believe he was uh, he was suspended indefinitely. Um, and I think they kind of try to sweep this under the rug because I never saw anything about this at all. Um, but now it's come out that he's, he's uh, suspended for eight games. Uh, it was uh, for misconduct uh, using offensive language at the end of the first period of a home game against the Utica Comets. Because uh, he's oh, he signed to a professional tryout too. Jeez, mm-hmm. that is that's even worse. Um, yeah, he was a part of the Rochester Americans, which I believe are the feeder team for the Sabers. Sabers, yeah. I was gonna say uh, Buffalo yeah. Sabers, yeah. Um, and then America's general manager, uh, Jason Carmanos, Ka- Ka- uh, said the same. We have no about tolerance for any form of hate and regret and any any harm this comment has inflicted. Um, I remember an original statement that said that the it was um, the original statement that I saw said something on the lines of these was something on the lines of saying, uh, the comments that are made on the ice don't reflect the, this organization. It's like, say what it is. A slur. The yeah, is, I mean, yeah. It, it, it doesn't take much to read between the lines and yeah. what he what he said, right? And it's like you're talking about a 34 year old career minor leaguer, like yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. It's like, again, yeah. continue to shine a spotlight on these people. You know, mm-hmm. people will continue to tell on themselves, and it becomes you know uh, they they essentially do the work. They do the work of quote unquote canceling for us in a sense like it's not a matter of people canceling them they just continue to dig themselves a deeper hole essentially yeah completely also so. on top of that as well too uh, as part of the suspension Holmstrom will be participating in diversity and inclusion education and you know the Eric American Hockey League is committed to building a culture that is safe inclusive and free from abuse uh, clearly they are and let's let's hope this does something at least because at least not send the message to the rest of the league this is I mean, with both of those stories, you have to hope it leads to a little bit more and more change elsewhere instead of just where it happened. Yeah. Uh, to wrap up today's show, because, again, it will be a bit of a shorter show, uh, random stat fun time again. Starting off with the Nashville Predators, where Roman Yossi has set the franchise record for points in the season. He is a defender, <laughs> and he has 12 games to go craziness uh he becomes the first uh just the third defenseman in the last 30 years to record 12 three-point games in a season joining paul coffee and phil housley who both did it in the early 90s and he moves ahead of brent burns uh his total from the 1819 season for most points by a defender in the salary cap era roman yossi for norris i will not hear otherwise what about roman yossi for hart <sighs> You know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, Shesterkin's been sh- been struggling lately. If he keeps struggling down the stretch, I agree he might cost himself the heart. Yeah. But at the same time, is it not even more impressive that he was able to do as well as he did for the entirety of the season? Like, 
He still has a league leading 935 save percentage. The next highest is Sorokin at a 927. It's like, oh, well, he has a 940 instead of a 935, so we can't give him the heart. Like, okay, let's let's not be ridiculous here now, all right? Like, might be struggling in the last 10 games or so, but at the same time, uh, his last game was a 30-save shutout against the Pittsburgh Penguins. <laughs> uh, yeah, look at the last five games for Shesterkin. Actually, last, uh, yeah, last five games. Uh, three of them against Pittsburgh, by the way. 952, 917, 833, 885, and a shutout against Pittsburgh. Like, as long as he plays Pittsburgh, he'll win the heart, apparently. Yeah. That's what we're yeah, seeing. That's fair. <laughs> Back to look at goalies again. I still think UC Soros is going to win uh, quickly, just, just throwing out Vesna stuff. We're talking about awards. I think Soros wins the Vesna because of how many games he's played, regardless, and how he's, what he's at right now. He's played 59 games, uh, 2.55 goals against average, and a 921 save percentage. Reminder that he's got like it's basically it's literally just him ca- carrying, completely carrying Nashville because the other goalies in the roster who are on there are David Riddich, uh, who has Jesus Christ, Dave, uh, great save, Dave, uh, fall off a cliff, Dave, uh, Connor Ingram, David Riddick are both the two goalies there. Riddick's got eleven games played, Ingram's got two. <laughs> 890 for Riddich for uh, Ingram 906 uh, for save percentage. I'm telling you, like, you see, people will be mad no matter what because some good player won't get an award that they're probably deserving of. That's how it works. Speaking of which, Connor McDavid for the Oilers, 15 game point streak, career high 42 goals. <laughs> Um, shout out to Mike Smith. Um, he can't stop pucks, but at least he can pass pucks to McDavid for oh, an OT cool. winner that in San cool. Jose. He always was great at passing the puck. He is arguably the best uh, passer, of one of at least one of the best passers of the puck all time in terms of goaltenders. Like that's just, it's just yeah, it's just a fact about Mike Smith. He's, it's it's probably his greatest tool. Uh, and the Oilers out of nowhere have a six game winning streak for the first time since 2015-16. Despite the fact that their goaltending sucks. So, much like uh, Leafs fans, I don't know if they know what to make of their team come playoff time, but they can hope for the best. Sorry to throw that in there again, but I had to. That's fine. That is completely fine. Um, I think the one thing we forgot to mention that um, at the beginning of the... um, I think it was the beginning of the... Panthers game. Apparently, Chalgren got hurt. From what I heard. Uh, okay, a Leafs goalie got hurt. How is this news? This is. I woke up and brushed my teeth. It's fucking Toronto. It's a fucking Houdini back there. Like, what the fuck is going on? What are you putting in your water? Who is their goalie coach? What are you not feeding them? Give them fucking one a day vitamins so they don't fucking tear their ACLs. Christ. Okay, Cole Caulfield scored his seventeenth <laughs> goal as a hab. Uh, he had, he now has 16 goals in 26 games under Martin St. Louis. Uh, he would be right there with Moritz Sider for the Calder if St. Louis was the head coach at the start of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Justin Barron, who was uh, acquired as well uh, from Colorado, scored his first NHL goal. Habs are another one of those teams. The front office, the leadership core, uh, they are going to be super, super dangerous if they play their cards right moving forward. Which is bad news for Bruins fans like myself, as the team will probably trend down. Right as those teams are trending upward, there could be some rough years ahead. But we won't talk about that now. We'll talk about it when it happens. Uh, for the Canucks, Bo Horvat became the first Canuck to score 30 goals in a season since Redeem Verbata. <laughs> wow. 2014-15. You're telling me Brock Besser never hit 30 goals? No. Like that was the thing that was shocking to me. Like Brock Besser. Brock Besser was has hyped. never hit 30 goals. He was hyped for a for like a quick minute and then just kind of went like mm. He has uh awesome man. It's just the injuries. 29 goals in 62 games back in 1718, 26 in 69, 23 in 56. If it wasn't for injuries for Brock Besser. I guess that kind of explains the uh the stat and um, 
for Bo Horvat, since March 9th, he is tied with both McDavid and Matthews for 13 goals, um, which is shocking. Uh, the number might have changed after the Leafs' most recent game. And Elias Patterson, as of last night, now has 30 points in his last 21 games after everyone was uh, saying, why is he cooked? He's not. It's just the man had a bit of a down year, yeah. but he's still great. And I still think the Canucks are set up really well with the one-two of Pedersen and Horvat down the middle. You know, again, another team. You play your cards right, especially this offseason. I can't imagine they won't be a playoff team next year. I mean, they're honestly not that far off now. It's just the start of this year was so bad for them before Boudreaux stepped in. Yeah, Bruce Boudreaux did kind of save that franchise from possibly having to have another fucking rebuild. Um, like, I don't know what else there is to say. Like, that team was just not looking that great, and he's brought his barbecue out and, and started to cook a little bit. So, for the Red Wings, Moritz Sider joins Quinn Hughes of the Canucks as the only two defensemen in the last 25 years with 40 assists in their rookie season. <laughs> wow. So I didn't talk about what the Bruins, they got pooped on by the Red Wings. Uh, it was the second half of a back-to-back. But Moritz Sider is, for all the talk about the eye test, Moritz Sider passes the eye test unlike maybe anybody else um, on that Red Wings team. He is all over the place. He goes for hits constantly. He is, it's like he's the freaking love child of Nick Cronwall and Nick Lidstrom. Like, you take some of the better aspects of those two (laughs) players and put them together, and he has those traits and tendencies. Oh, I like that. Steve Iserman's a fucking genius. I like that. Just the way you describe that, holy shit. That's like how I play in East Show, except I don't make any hits, and I just give the other team the puck, (laughs) and I do fucking spinaroonies on the blue line. Uh, for the Devils here as well, we talked about Quinn. We'll talk about Jack Hughes. Of course, last show we mentioned uh, the knee injury off of the contact with Oliver Wallstrom. It's an MCL sprain in his left knee. He will miss the rest of the year. Finishes the season with 56 points in 49 games, which is fantastic. Yep. Um, and he finishes his 20-year-old season with a 1.143 points per game pace. Only three players have a better rate or had a better rate at age 20. Crosby, McDavid, and Ovechkin. That is how good Jack Hughes has been so far. That's fucking nuts. Especially with how, honestly, kind of poor his first season was, or how poorly his first season was viewed, Mm -hmm. where he had 21 points in 61 games, and everyone's like, oh, you shouldn't have rushed him. He's cooked. And, well, here he is. He still can't win face-offs to save his life. He's still at 35% career now 366 yeah. games maybe should be a winger but um no nah, man jack hughes is legit and i know devils fans are real sick and tired of the fact that they just missed the playoffs again but much like the sabers play your cards right i think they're gonna be okay it's just very tough to see that after another disappointing year hold on let's see where they're gonna finish uh in terms of you know where they're projected to finish in the standings <sighs> It's got to be bottom five, I would think. So who would they? I can't imagine they... they're. I can't imagine they're. I'm looking. Yeah, right now they're fourth, fourth from the bottom. So the the reverse NHL standings. I have it up here. The Coyotes forty nine points, Montreal fifty one, Seattle fifty two, New Jersey fifty four, and Philadelphia fifty seven. Those are the bottom five. All of those teams have seventy one of eighty two played. I mean, I I don't I, I don't know. New, New Jersey's a lock. It's, it seems like unless Ottawa really struggles down the stretch, it seems like New Jersey's a lock for bottom five. Uh, you know, right. in terms of the better lottery odds, uh, I don't know if they'll be able to out suck Seattle, Montreal, and Arizona. <laughs> but without Jack Hughes, they might. And without I think Bernier and Blackwood are both still out, which is just. Brutal. <laughs> like they're relying on God, is Hammond still out? Okay, so their goalies right now on cap for the air, Andrew Hammond and Nico Dawes. Right. Both of whom have a sub nine hundred save percentage. Gotcha. Yikes. Yikes, yeah. yikes, yikes. I think Nico Dawes is getting rushed. I still think he needs more time to develop. 
I think he's it was a necessity, good. I think, due to the injuries. So yeah, but that's, that's why they went out got Hammond at the deadline, and then he got hurt. Like once he got there, <laughs> it's been a carousel of goaltending completely over there. Like it's it's bad. That's that's the one thing too. A lot of guys who they're good when they when they're healthy, but the thing is they're not cons- healthy enough to be consistent. Peter Mrazek, um, mm. Jonathan Bernier. Um, I could go on for a whole bunch of lists of guys who who are good, but when they get injured, they're just cooked. Like you're, they're, they're obviously cooked because they're injured, but they're, it's just too inconsistent. And the final thing from random stat fun time. This comes from Corey. I think it's Masisak. I'm not sure. M A S I S A K. Alex Ovechkin has 1,400 career points. Sidney Crosby has 1,397. So this is a stat that's along the lines of the McDavid thing. You remember that from the other week, where it's like, oh, McDavid has more points than anybody who was drafted in 2011 beyond, and he was drafted in 2015, 2016. This stat is nuts. So again, Ovi and Crosby both essentially at 1,400 points. Among players who entered the NHL after 1992-93, only Joe Thornton has more points than those two. Damn. Think about this. The top three in scoring for players who debuted in the 92-93 season or after is Thornton, Ovechkin, and Crosby. That is fucking nuts. Like, think about that. Thornton is 138 points ahead of Ovechkin. And Thornton joined the league in, what, 97? And Ovi didn't play until 2005, 2006. It's the lockout, right? Yeah, after because he had that first year taken away because of the lockout. Right. Like, Alex Ovechkin, if it wasn't for lockouts, I mean, granted, Thornton would have benefited as well from not being a... Uh, you know, uh, having time taken away from lockouts. But that stat, and we've seen a lot of those pop up recently. But think about how many fucking great players debuted in the early 90s all the way up through, and that's the top three in scoring. Blew my mind, and it's like, it, you know, it's one of the reasons why we like to have random stat fun time on this show because there's just certain numbers where it's like, man, I don't know how much conversation we can get out of this, but at the same time, God damn it, that stat's insane. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> so, Endo, with that, we will look to wind things down for today. Again, apologies, everyone, that uh, we didn't have sin on the show, and apologies for it being maybe a little bit rushed, maybe a little bit low energy. I'm still low energy from, like, I'm trying to get my voice back from Wednesday <laughs> at this point. <laughs> but we thank you guys for being here. Uh, again, another reminder, uh, take care of your... Your, your hair. I don't care if it's where it is, as we've learned on today's show. Manscaped, again, the place to be. Code Doogie, 20% off your order. Free worldwide shipping at checkout. Use Code Doogie. Endo Mills, what do you have going on here as we say goodbye to the people? I have a fun fact, actually. We didn't cover Ooh. this, but everyone's favorite AHL Zamboni goalie turned e-bug hero David Ayers has been Announced as the newest coach for the Vermilion County Bobcats of the SPHL. What does I that mean? I believe that's real. What? <laughs> I totally believe you that that's a real team. That is a real I saw, thing. I saw that this is real, but just the name is hilarious. That team had five wins and 45 losses, 82 goals for, 260 goals against. With a minus 178 <laughs> plus minus. And a so point two seven up. goals against. Go, go, uh, points per game. Point this, two seven. This, this was their first season in the SPHL, the <gasps> Southern Professional Hockey League. They play in Danville, Illinois. This was their first season, and they were, uh, they were that bad. They, uh, they lost Ayers' first game seven to four. <laughs> Uh, to the Evansville Thunderbolts. This is a great league in terms of names. Also featuring uh, the Macon Mayhem, not quite as good as the Macon Whoopie. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> the Knoxville Ice Bears, and of course, everyone's favorite, the Roanoke Rail Yard Dogs, D A W G S. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> Shout out to a um, uh, player who is now on loan for the South Carolina Stingrays in the ECHL, um, Mitch Atkins, who has a whopping five goals and fourteen assists for nineteen points in fifty-two games. With the county Bobcats. Nice. And he's project- David Ayers, future head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh, goalie coach. Jesus Christ. Maybe he'll teach you about being uh, consistent. Anyways, for me, what I've got going on, besides spouting out random facts about David Ayers that cope with the fact that we still lost that game, what, year, like three years ago now. Uh, I'm streaming every day. I'm working on a big project for Tug. Uh, hopefully this mm. format does go over for other stuff. So that way it makes it really, really easy to make more videos for you guys. Um, yeah, uh, I had a lot of personal stuff that I wanted to get through on the channel for my stuff, but I figured, ah, eh, making Tugi stuff. I might as well just park the bus on my stuff as well. There you go. Fair enough. And of course you can catch me everywhere. Tugi 24 again, despite that impending vacation, uh, there'll still be stuff up on YouTube all the time, as Endo kind of mentioned. Uh, but yeah, heading towards around this time next week, your boy is going to be on the road. Uh, so streams, podcasts will be affected. But damn it, I haven't taken a vacation um, ever <laughs> since I started on YouTube and Twitch. It's been a while, so uh, it'll be nice to get away. But again, I'll still be here for the next couple of days at the very least. Thank you guys again for watching. And again, I hope you enjoyed the show for what it was. Appreciate you all. And we will see you next time. When's the last time we had a podcast under an hour? That was under an Shocker. hour? Yeah. Look at us. Look at us. Here we are. Stall for time. Uh, Manscaped. Tugi, tu- Tugi code. Stretch. Tugi code. Uh, cylinder. Uh, Order in. Spherical. It smells great. Use it anywhere you want uh, with reason.